And I'm going to tell you about Ashley. I'm not going to read from her bio. I'm going to try to remember when I met Ashley. Where did I meet Ashley? Was it Vermont? Yeah, it was Vermont. It's got to. Okay, yeah, okay. It was, yeah. I met her about a year ago. So um, a friend of mine who didn't come today because Dr. Oz is better, Shivane Joshi, he um, started a special interest group at the AHS meeting um, on um, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, which is a lo long, lot of words for um, one-sided headaches that have eyelid flushing and all that. And the main one is cluster headaches. So he invited some people from cluster busters. You were associated with cluster busters. That's why you were there. So we were at this small special interest group, which is great. There's only like eight people in the room. And then we had cluster busters there. And we're not usually in a room with patients. So it was really nice to be in a room with Bob Wald. And Ashley was there. And Ashley and I got to know each other. And I love cluster headache. I love treating cluster headache. Um, and cluster headache is um, just as prevalent in society as multiple sclerosis, but it gets zero funding, and it gets zero recognition. It gets zero on top of zero, zero times zero. Um, but it's suicide headache. It's the worst pain known to man. Look up the worst pain known to man. It's 10 times worse than a, passing a kidney stone or having a baby by natural childbirth. So I'd just like to, to bring Ashley up here and let her tell you her story. And she's written a phenomenal book, and I've learned so much from that. And now I'll give this book to all my cluster headache patients. Hi, uh, I'm Ashley Haddle, and I've had episodic cluster headaches since 2007. It started out every six months for two weeks at a time, and I didn't know what was happening, and I would go to the emergency room, they would give me opioids, and then I would go back, and they'd give me more, even though I was saying, hey, this isn't working, and then after a while, I just stopped going. Uh, when I was 22, they, my episodic cycles grew to two and a half months, and that wasn't doable anymore. Uh, so I kept going back to my PCP, and I finally found a really good one who recognized cluster headaches and did give me a prescription for oxygen, but it was an oxygen concentrator, which doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work, you know, and a nasal cannula doesn't work either. So seven years after they started, I got in to see a neurologist and got an official diagnosis. And I got an oxygen prescription for 12 to 15 liters per minute. But it was still another two years before I knew how to correctly use it. And that was when I went to a Cluster Busters conference and they had an oxygen demo. So as I became a part of the cluster headache community through the nonprofit Cluster Busters, I found out that I'm not the exception. A majority of the patients I know have waited years to, for a diagnosis and then additional years for high flow oxygen, even though it's the most effective treatment with the fewest side effects. What was frustrating for me was the lack of information in books online and in my various doctor's clinics, because I had seen at least five at that point. So I did the research and I interviewed more than 40 people and I published a textbook for patients and for doctors uh, last year on cluster headaches. And Christina has asked me to read, uh, to start my presentation by reading chapter one. So, oh no, where's the clicker? Christina. <laughs> okay, thank you. So while I read this, I'm going to leave this slide up. Uh, this is one of the first pages in my book, and it's a quote from doctors and patients and their family members who I interviewed. And you can see that it's kind of a collective voice saying, we need help, and these attacks are awful, and they are not just a headache. So uh, there are no words to describe what a cluster headache attack feels like adequately, but somehow each sufferer, sufferer manages to explain it just the same. These attacks may only last up to three hours, but in that time, every patient, known as cluster heads, contemplates suicide at least once. This illustration, drawn by Fletcher the Artist and appropriately named Cluster Headache, has become the universal image of a cluster headache patient. These attacks are so agonizing that the pain seems foreign as if the devil himself is stabbing and tugging at your eye and temple. 
This chapter details an attack from start to finish to help supporters, friends, and family members understand what we experience. Describing the indescribable. It's difficult to discuss. The pain of an attack scars you, not physically, but mentally. So much so that hearing the word cluster used in any form makes you want to jump out of your skin. Women sometimes say they forget how painful childbirth is until they have another child. It's similar with cluster heads. The agony is so searing and so scary that we must forget about it to survive. That is, until the next one begins. It's always shocked me the level of pain that I was feeling, said Bob Wald, uh, founder of Cluster Busters. It's more painful than can be described and that you would ever really think could exist without actually dying or at least knocking you out or going into shock. It takes some time to get through the mental part about living through an attack like that. For episodics, every day between cluster cycles is full of wishful thinking. But instinctively, you stop making plans when you're due for another bout of it. For me, that's spring and fall. Those final weeks dwindle down into days until each morning you're crossing your fingers, hoping not today. But then today arrives. It hits you in the car, at work, in the grocery store, or even on your honeymoon. And time stops for a moment. That eternal second begs one question that the bottom of your belly already knows the answer to. Has it started? The slightest twinge of discomfort, not pain, but discomfort, starts at the base of your skull or in the depths of your temple. You stare straight ahead, attempting to will it to stop here. Ten seconds pass, and a sharp knife begins to bore into your brain, as if someone was holding you hostage and threatening to stab right through your eye unless you comply. Only there is no way to please this thief, and you realize that his intention is not to kill, but to torture. I could assimilate a gunshot wound, a stab wound, a hot poker in my eye. It still couldn't supersede to the pain that we feel every day, several times a day, said Tom Tremere, chronic patient. You stop the car. You make an excuse to leave work because the amount of time it would take to tell of this misery would leave you crying on the ground. You drop the groceries and you run. You run like the grim reaper is at your heels because it feels like he's already found you and plunged the, the Sith into your head. If you've ever slapped your thumb in the car door where the pain is so bad where you have to shake your hand, that's kind of like what you need to do with your head and your body because it's so bad that you can't sit still, said Walt. Hopefully, there's an oxygen tank or injection nearby, which could bring you solace within minutes. If there's not, you lose all hope. You know it will end eventually, maybe 45 minutes, maybe three hours, but in that time, Dante walks your, your soul through hell and back. There's a small fish that wakes up in my head and it has razor blade fins and they're just turning and floating around, said Denise Loveland Bow, episodic, trying to describe the pain. It shoots out these lightning bolts and the fish is trying to rip this eyeball out of the back of my head. You find a room to make your own and lock the world out. No one can see what's about to ensue. Your first instinct is to break something cursing this horrid disease while it turns up to 11. You pace and hit your head with your palm, but that's not enough of a distraction. There's a remote, your cell phone, or even a hammer that looks promising, so you beat on your skull until you know you've done more harm than good. Nothing can do you any good now. What I like most about DirecTV is the remote that comes with it is the perfect size and shape to, said Dr. Larry Shore, who's episodic, I think that's distracting. I've learned to moderate that I don't use a hammer and break through my cranium or anything like that, but there's still something comforting about doing it. I know that's crazy, and I know that doesn't help, but there's a compulsion to do that. There's a mirror in the bathroom, the car, or wherever your safe place of isolation happens to be this time. You look at yourself, though experience tells you to shy away. A swollen eye looks back at you with tears streaming down the side of your face that you wish you could cut off. With one shaking hand, you cover the crying half of your face. For a split second, you look normal, but then an icy dagger drives into the center of your skull and your eyes roll back. You scream, that kind of scream that comes from breaking an arm or leg, a chilling sound which makes dogs tuck their tails, children turn from fear, and adults freeze wide-eyed with su suspicion, because how could it possibly hurt that much? And they're right, how could it hurt this much? In what world is it fair to feel such pain over and over and over and yet not die? 
So in that second, mind you, we're only 10 minutes into this, you daydream about ending your life, not in a woe is me way, but in a to end all pain forever fantasy. It's an unimaginable pain to explain to anybody who's never experienced it before, said Tom Tremere. Suicide is a very viable option based solely on the pain, not on depression. Someone knocks on the door or the window or the stall and startles you back to reality. This horrible reality where everyone just stares at you in disbelief, wondering if they should call the hospital or the police because you look crazed. You look like you're having a stroke and you don't care. Maybe if the police came, they could just shoot you and get on with it. I isolate myself because I don't want other people to see me because I know they'll get so terrified, said Laura Oburn, episodic patient. I've been stuck in my car because I had nowhere to go and I couldn't drive. I've seen people see me and they've called 911 or, call, or hammered on my window. Whoever that person turns out to be, you either shut them out or beg them to kill you. Please, please make it end, you say. But then you see tears start to form in their eyes and you realize how mean that was for you to say and resolve to go it alone. It sounds horrible, but to be honest, I've asked my husband to kill me, said Oberyn. I would rather be dead than go through another one. They try to make you feel better by saying lay down or try Excedrin migraine or essential oils help me. <laughs> or the worst, I get those too. They're trying to help. They're trying to fix you, but you feel more isolated than ever because you've tried all that. Injections help, but insurance won't cover them. Oxygen helps, but insurance won't cover that either. You're alone, or at least you feel alone. Stupid things people say that are really annoying, like, have you tried the Tylenol PM, said Dr. Shore. No, I skipped right over that and went to a fistful of Percocet that ricocheted off and didn't do a goddamn thing. <laughs> you snap at them, because they most likely never have and will never feel this. Secretly, you wish they could feel it just once, but then immediately take it back because no one deserves this. They rush away sad and confused to Google cluster headaches and cures, only to find that your personal purgatory of pain is a lifelong sentence with zero understanding of why and zero understanding from those who've never had to endure this. And you do, you endure this. You see it through because there is no other way. You don't truly want to die. You know that once this passes, it will become a memory which you will push to the depths of your past until it rises before you again. The clock on your radio, the wall, or your watch ticks by, and some evildoer keeps taking the knife out and plunging it deeper and deeper. You go back to hitting yourself on the head with your hand or any loose object you can find. The stabbing sensation travels to your ear, which makes you wonder if putting a pin through your eardrum would help. You're thankful for the momentary vacation from your temple, but then it settles back behind your eye. You think, in all seriousness, maybe I'll pull out my eye. That would help. There's too much pressure. There's not enough room for my brain. So your thumb and your forefinger find your eye socket, and you dig your nails around your eyeball. In your mind, it feels as if your eye is rightfully about to pop out on its own accord, but in actuality, it feels smaller than normal. It feels like someone trying to push my eye out from the socket from the inside with some sort of semi-sharp object, said Bob Bowling, chronic patient. As you grip your eye tighter, you realize that 10 seconds ago, you felt worse. Your muscles begin to ease, and you know it's declining. You release your eye, the, clock, the clocks keep ticking, your thoughts stay empty, because suddenly each thought brings back the dagger. A patient in London actually did pull out his eye during an attack. They had to replace it with a glass eye. When the patient described it, he said it didn't make a difference, and it didn't hurt more or less. Can you imagine pulling out your eye and not feeling better or worse? If you have cluster headaches, you can. But if you don't, try for a second to imagine a feeling so excruciating that you would mutilate yourself like that. And so you get up. When did you fall to the floor? You forget the question because another spike goes through your head. You walk back to the mirror to watch the demon leave. And sure enough, color has returned to your cheeks, but the face itself is still unrecognizable. This you is not you, and you long for your old self. During the decline, you decide to lay down. As the intensity decreases, you start to cry. It's a mixture of relief and loss because, because with each attack, you lose a bit of yourself. You've now visited a world in which even the most heinous of villains should never be banished. You don't get to come back unscathed. Finally, it's over. 
It's been 57 minutes, and yes, you know exactly how many seconds and minutes have passed. Every muscle is drained. Five minutes ago, you couldn't imagine sitting still, but now you can't imagine standing. You grab a pen and write down when it began and when it ended. You notice the headache diary entry from yesterday. You see, it's 2.58 p.m. on a Tuesday, and yesterday's diary reads 2 a.m., 8 a.m., 2 p.m., 8 p.m., six hours. Six hours until it's back. How can you accomplish anything when your life ends every six hours? And so a switch flips in your mind, blocking the last hour from your memory. That's the only way you can cope, said Oberon, because it's such a burden that you don't even realize. I try to pretend it's never going to happen again just for my own sanity. Days turn to weeks, and for the lucky yet not so lucky episodics, such as myself, it ends for a couple months or years. For the chronics, each day is a gamble, because this immense pain could not possibly come, oh, sorry. Each day is a gamble with the devil himself, because this immense pain could not possibly come from a part of you. It is an other, an it, a beast, one you can never defeat, but you keep fighting because fighting is your only option. This thing, said Dr. Shore, this thing that not only felt like nothing else I've experienced physically, but like nothing else I've experienced emotionally. Even though I know one day my house won't be my house, and the bank still holds the paper on it until it's paid off, it's my house. This is my hand, my head, my face, all of that. It's me. Every other condition I've had has felt like me. I got six screws and a titanium plate in my spine, and it's still me. The cluster headaches, the cluster attack has always felt like an otherly entity, some sort of horrible invader. Thank you. Uh, so following that chapter, I thought it would be really beneficial to show a few very short videos of what an attack looks like. Uh, it is shocking, so be prepared for that. So what I'm trying to show is that an attack looks the same regardless of gender or age. You can't sit still. Uh, so what, what I'm going to focus on today is misdiagnosis and delayed diagnosis and then oxygen. Ainsley Corse is a friend of mine in Scotland and it took her 15 years to get the right, correct diagnosis. She was misdiagnosed with migraines first. What makes this more disappointing was that she was an emergency room nurse surrounded by doctors who still said she had migraines. And she was told her pain was imaginary, that she was attention-seeking or drug-seeking, when narcotics don't work for cluster headaches. Triptans do. Uh, and then Bob Wald makes a very good point in his quote that episodic cluster headaches are, are really strange. At one point, I thought Benadryl had cured me <laughs> because whether Benadryl worked or it was the natural progression of that cycle, I'm not sure, but it's never worked since. And so I, I think what a lot of medical professionals don't realize is that if a patient isn't getting relief through the treatment you're providing, or at least information, they're not going to come back when the attacks come back. They're going to go to another doctor. And uh, Bob Wald actually had several teeth extracted, a root canal. 
He was told it was a sinus infection, and he has a slide with 72 medications he's taken over the last 30 years. So I wanted to throw some statistics in there. Uh, a 2014 study found that even though patients were describing the pain in, in the same way, the, the ice pick, the I can't sit still, strictly one-sided, that they still weren't being diagnosed right away or were being misdiagnosed. So this study showed that 76% of patients had seen a physician when they started getting an attack, yet it took 4.1 to 5.6 years to get a first consult at a headache center. Before that, they had seen, 49% uh, had seen a neurologist, 35% a PCP, 10% ear, nose, and throat specialist, and 3% a dentist. 77% uh, were misdiagnosed at the first consult, some with trigeminal neuralgia, migraine without aura, sinusitis, or sinus headache, which we've heard a lot about today. Uh, and a previous study uh, focused on African-American women uh, showed the same thing to be true because, well, I'll wait for the next slide. Uh, so there seems to be a persistent gender and ethnic bias when it comes to diagnosing cluster headaches. It's been seen as a man's disease for so many decades that it's uh, women and people of color and children who are having to wait the longest to get the correct diagnosis and the right treatment. So uh, in, or in order to un overcome this unconscious bias, uh, I think it's important, and, and I know uh, many of you know this, but to truly listen to those indicators and ask the right questions like Christina was saying, uh, to at least be on the right path. And then when you don't have answers, send them to somebody who will have more. Uh, and then lastly, there aren't enough uh, headache specialists and neurologists to go around. Patients are going to the dentist, to the ENT, to the um, PCP, and the emergency room especially. So it's about making sure that other medical professionals know this information and know what to look and watch for. So uh, I'm guessing a lot of you have heard about the cluster personality. So uh, in 1969, Dr. Graham uh, presented this in Chicago and it wasn't really based on much evidence. It was uh, 100 people, 90 of whom were men and uh, mainly middle-aged men. So, so it became this thing where only somebody like this can have cluster headaches. And I've personally experienced this. When I was being diagnosed at a, a notable uh, headache center, I went through two hours of testing and met with three or four nurses in that time. And every single one of them would ask about my migraines. And I would respond with, when I'm in a cluster cycle, or when I have these, uh, when I have these headaches. And it took the neurologist two minutes to, to say, yes, you have cluster headaches, and then explain it to, to his staff. So that was really frustrating for me. Uh, so what I'm getting at is this still remains a thought in the minds of many medical professionals. And so I want to play a quick game with you guys called Patient or Supporter. So if you, oh, oh no, damn, all right. Uh, do you think that she is a patient? Close, or raise your hand. Okay, if she, who thinks she's a supporter? Okay, she is a supporter. Sorry, trick question. Uh, so Kristen's husband, Tom Tremere, who I quoted in the book, he's had four brain surgeries. And after each one, he woke up with an attack. He, uh, it took him 11 months to be properly diagnosed, and before that, he'd had teeth removed and two root canals. Even though he was diagnosed in 11 months, it took him nine years to get oxygen. Uh, the strangest treatment he's, he's done is magic mushrooms and brain surgery. And uh, Christina mentioned earlier that cluster headaches are nicknamed suicide headaches, and it's because uh, surveys within the cluster headache community uh, and involving physicians have found that uh, cluster headache patients are 
20 cluster headache patients consider suicide at 20 times the rate of the national average. And so Tom, in 2008, he jumped in front of a bus because he couldn't handle having cluster headaches anymore. He survived. And when I met him in 2014 at my first Cluster Busters conference, he was actually 32 days pain-free for the first time in nine years, I believe. And it was because he had tried an alternative treatment, which is currently being studied at Yale, uh, psilocybin mushrooms. And Tom also has migraines. And he can very easily tell you the difference. Uh, Tom's brain surgeries uh, have left him on permanent disability. He lives in London, Ontario, and he struggles with a lot of the, the side effects that you can see listed right there, along with PTSD and neuropathic pain. So who thinks she is a patient? Okay. Who thinks she's a supporter? All right. She is a patient. This is Polly. And she was misdiagnosed for 15 years, uh, told she had a TMJ disorder, that it was hormones, that it was stress. So she had braces, and I, I'm sure she would have had kids anyway. Uh, and when she finally found a neurologist who, knew, who diagnosed her properly, she was only given verapamil. And it took, uh, and then she found a new neurologist who she swears by, who gave her sumatriptan injections and oxygen along with preventatives, so a, a really good treatment plan. And she's been three years pain-free now. Uh, she's episodic, typically every two years. And it took two years after her diagnosis for her to get oxygen, so that was the, the timeline. Who thinks he is a patient? Okay, who thinks he's a supporter? He is a patient. So this is Patrick. Uh, he and his wife, Ginny, are an incredible couple, very kind and giving. He has had, he started out episodic for 12 years and then he switched to the chronic form for 17 years. It took him eight years to be properly diagnosed and then 20 plus years to get an oxygen prescription. He has really struggled for all of these years and his wife has talked him out of suicide several times, and he used to go to the emergency room for help. He used to say, I need oxygen, and they wouldn't give him oxygen. So he finally started saying, I have suicide headaches, and he was institutionalized. And Ginny got him out of there fast. Uh, and so uh, a few years ago, I think this was three years ago, he put a revolver to his head and it jammed. I don't, I don't know guns that well, but I am told that it's very rare for this particular gun to jam. Patient or supporter? Who thinks patient? Who thinks supporter? Okay. Supporter. So uh, he's a friend of Kathy. Kathy has both migraines and cluster headaches, and her clusters started when she was five. She was told for 33 years that it was all migraines when she knew she knew the difference. Uh, and so she says, my attacks have been called migraine overreacting, attention seeking, and even hysterical migraine because of the agitation. Listen to what your, parent, your patients are telling you. They know their bodies and experiences better than they do. The best results come from truly listening and working together as a team. And so it took her 30 years to get a diagnosis and another two years to get oxygen. In her case, she got the oxygen prescription right away. It was the oxygen company who wouldn't give it to her for two years. And uh, I do have an update. Uh, she has not attempted suicide, but has had ideations many times. All right, last one. Patient or supporter? Think patient. Yep, this is Phil. He's actually one of the lucky ones. He was diagnosed right away in 2010 uh, within 10 to 15 minutes with a neurologist. He was uh, given an oxygen prescription right away, uh, hasn't really tried any strange treatments, and 
uh, has only had ideations of suicide uh, because of the attacks themselves. Oh, sorry, there is one more. Uh, who thinks she is a patient? Who thinks she's a supporter? All right, she's a supporter, uh, as am I, to my husband, Andrew Clemenshaw. This is him and his mom when he was 12 in Rome. That's the year he started getting chronic cluster headaches, and he has had them ever since. And he's 26 now, so 14 years. Uh, he, he went to uh, a psychiatrist who told his mom that it was psychosomatic, so for three months she told him that he could make it go away. Uh, he had a spinal tap done to see if that was the issue. Uh, so many doctors, he had his wisdom teeth removed before they were erupting. And he was finally admitted to the Diamond Headache Clinic and treated by Dr. Seymour Diamond. He doesn't respond to oxygen, uh, quickly developed a tolerance to Toradol, and is otherwise treatment refractory. Uh, he, the strangest treatments he's tried is licorice root and LSD, and LSD is actually the only thing that's ever given him pain-free time. Uh, his mother actually found out about it when he was 16 and waited until he was 18 to tell him about it. They'd thrown everything but the kitchen sink at him, and it wasn't working, so there was this information online through Cluster Busters that it might work, and what's a desperate mother going to do? Uh, so he tried it, and he got 48 hours pain-free. And so that is the, the only treatment that's ever worked for him. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about oxygen, which uh, what I'm trying to say should be the first thing a cluster headache patient gets following diagnosis. The most... So getting the prescription isn't necessarily the issue, it's getting the prescription filled. So you can help a cluster headache patient get this filled by making sure it has all of the information. So it has to say oxygen therapy for cluster headache. It has to say 15 liters per minute with a non-rebreather mask because they don't want to give you a high flow regulator and they don't want to give you a mask because it's for headaches. And some oxygen companies uh, make sure their employees know about clusters, but most don't. I've spent a lot of time on the phone arguing with oxygen companies. So the flow rate is the most important part because you're not going to get relief uh, from five liters per minute. The research shows at least 12 liters per minute is what's gonna work. Uh, 15 is what most patients use, and a lot of patients, including myself, up it to 25, and that, that's so the bag is always full when you need it. Uh, and some doctors won't prescribe oxygen because of a fear of oxygen toxicity. And yes, if there's a pre-existing lung issue, that could be it. But we're not using high flow oxygen for longer than 15 minutes at a time. So the mask is the next important part. The non-rebreather mask that the oxygen companies deliver have holes near the nose, and it needs to be 100% oxygen, and those, those don't work. So uh, patients either have to tape up the mask or can order the, the cluster headache mask that was specifically designed by patients for patients. Uh, so... At this high rate, which I'm sure many of you know, you're going to go through oxygen tanks very quickly. I have uh, two M tanks at home, one by the bed, one in the closet, and then six E tanks in, for, uh, in the car and when I need to leave the house. The E tanks themselves, they only last for three attacks. So next is the breathing technique. Uh, you have to hyperventilate in order to abort a cluster headache attack. And for me, it works within nine minutes. Some patients it takes 15, some 20. Uh, but it, the hyperventilation method seems to work the most. Some patients will do uh, breathing in through the mouth and out through the nose, but this seems to work the fastest. Uh, they can also get a demand valve, which helps... Uh, 
conserve the oxygen because if you're not actively breathing through the mask, it stops the flow. And then uh, it can cause a really dry throat, so some people will add a, a humidifier. So a study in 2010 by, uh, that released uh, results from the United States Cluster Headache Survey found that while 93% of patients knew about oxygen, only 34% had ever tried it, 44% had to tell their doctors, 45% had to find their own source of oxygen, such as welding oxygen, which is all too common. And uh, the prescriptions, 45% didn't, uh, only said the flow rate, 50% listed cluster headache, and only 28% mentioned the type of mask. And it is a struggle when the oxygen company comes to your house and you say, no, I don't need a nasal cannula. 70% uh, of patients found that it worked for them, but just 25 were using it. 16% it said, it said it was unaffordable, and 12% were using welder's oxygen. So as Christina said, uh, medication overuse uh, is a big issue. And I know this isn't a big study, but there aren't that many cluster headache patients. And my personal experience is that if I'm using sumatriptan, especially the full six milligram auto injectors or a full vial, I'm gonna get double the attacks. Uh, and the same goes for opioids and ergotamines. And opioids don't really work for cluster headaches anyway, so. Uh, one thing that I found is really beneficial, especially with the new sumatriptan auto injectors, they tend to go off in your purse. I've wasted three of them this year. So I talked to my neurologist and she wrote me a prescription for vials because I only need two to three milligrams to abort and that way I get more bang for my buck. And I, uh, at least in my case, it has uh, reduced the frequency or risk of rebound attacks or medication overuse headaches. So I've talked a lot about cluster busters. Uh, Bob Wald founded this nonprofit 18 or 19 years ago uh, to further the research and awareness and advocacy and just provide a place of support for cluster headache patients. And uh, thanks to, I'm also a board member, uh, thanks to Cluster Busters, there was a psilocybin study done at Harvard, there's a current one at Yale, and we're, we're constantly fighting for oxygen to be covered by CMS. We actually got a uh, letter from CMS three months ago declining to cover oxygen again. So hopefully that will change soon. And if you want to learn more, you can go to clusterbusters.org. My book is available on my website, uh, and there's uh, free shipping. I also have a bunch in the exhibit hall, if you're interested. It's also on my website. Yes, yes. Um, am, am I out of time? Can we do questions? Can we do questions yes. after the break? We're going yeah. to do a, a panel. Can everybody give her a standing ovation? She's done a great job. Mm -hmm.